Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and who was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now, you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come through at the appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. This is God's word. Good morning. Today begins Advent, as I'm sure you've already guessed. The first Sunday of four, as we anticipate celebrating the birth of Jesus. During this series, we are going to be engaged in a series called The Angels of Advent. Four stories from the Gospels where an angel appears and interacts with various characters who are part of the redemptive drama of Christmas. I'd like to begin this morning in the middle of the story that Jerry and Amanda just read to you, begin with the question that Zachariah asks after hearing from the angel, Zach, I'm sorry, uh, Gabriel. Zachariah says, how can I be sure of this? It's a very reasonable question, as he says. I'm an old man. My wife is well along in years. And I want to begin here because I think if we're honest, it's the question of all of us. I mean, does this question ever come into your mind even when you're sitting doing what you're doing right now? How can I be sure of this? Jesus, God who became human, who lived a righteous life because I can't, and then died upon a Roman cross as an atoning sacrifice, as a punishment for my sin, and oh, don't stop there, was then raised again three days after. And this secures for me, all of us, eternal life forever in him. How can I be sure of this? Or to be more practical, think about do you have a prayer that you pray without thinking about it? What's your deepest longing? What is for you what having a child was for Zachariah and Elizabeth? It's always there. It's what you really want. 
It's what if you were the author of your story, you'd already have. (laughs) It's probably relational, perhaps emotional, mental, vocational. I don't know. I know what mine are. I know where my thoughts go, where they just go. And it's usually a place of deep longing that I'm struggling, I'm fighting for hope. Now imagine that place, because Zachariah and Elizabeth clearly have one, and an angel appears and says, it's a done deal. You're going to receive it. It's going to happen. How can I be sure? I think more than anything else, this story that you just heard is a story about what being in a real relationship with a real God is really like. What being in a real relationship with a real God is really like. There are three scenes, very simple outline. Zachariah and Elizabeth begin this story and they're at home. Then the second scene is the longest of the three and because of that, there'll be two parts. Zachariah is in the temple. This is where the encounter with the angel occurs. And the story concludes in scene three, And Zechariah and Elizabeth are back at home. Reading a portion of where we begin with them at home, we learn that there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. This means they're both from priestly lines, which is a huge blessing Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Now, that word blameless, it doesn't mean that they were morally perfect. It simply means that when they didn't do something right, they did something wrong, they do what we do every Sunday, which is we pray a prayer of confession. We avail ourselves of the way in which God prescribed to receive mercy and forgiveness for him. So they're from the right kind of family, they're righteous in God's sight, and they do absolutely everything right, including when they do something wrong, they confess. Here's the first thing we learn about being in a real relationship with a real God and what that's really like. You can be from the right family. You can be righteous in God's sight. You can even do everything right and still not get what you want. And until you accept this reality of being human, you cannot experience what being in a real relationship with a real God is really like. Catholic theologian G.K. Chesterton once said, I always felt life first as a story. It feels like a story, does it not? And if there is a story, then there has to be a storyteller. And I would add humbly to Chesterton's comment, with, which I love, and if there is a storyteller, then the storyteller has to be sovereign, just like all authors are over their stories, which means we are characters. That's all we are. And characters often have no idea what's going to happen to them next, nor do they know why what is happening to them is happening to them. You can be from the right family. You can be righteous in God's sight, and we are because of Jesus. You can do absolutely everything right, even when you do something wrong, and still not get what you want. That's the first thing we learn about being in a real relationship with a real God and what that's really like. Now we go in to the temple. Once when Zachariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense into the most holy of holies all by himself, just him and God. It's time to step up. 
Zachariah must have said to himself, it's go time, all kinds of athletic metaphors here. Little does he know what's about to happen. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. All our hopes on Zach this time. I hope he's ready. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And standing at the right side of the altar of incense, and when Zachariah saw the angel, he was startled and gripped with fear. Be careful if you want God to show up in your life. The next thing that this story reveals about being in a real relationship with a real God is that until you are startled and gripped with fear, you probably aren't experiencing it. If you've never been shocked into silence, God may have not yet shown up in your life. And we're fast forwarding a little bit to the silence. But did you notice in verses 21 to 22, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, and this is while he's in the temple, and wondering why he stayed so long Then when he came out, he couldn't speak to them. And that's part two of the temple. We'll get to that in a minute. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. The reason that they know something had happened to Zechariah, Zechariah had received a vision from the Lord, is precisely because he couldn't talk to them about it. This is a great irony. The next time someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got a word from the Lord for you, you say, no, you don't, because you're talking. (laughs) When we really encounter the Lord, the emotional response, as far as I can tell, in every single one in the Bible is, go, gosh, startled, gripped with fear. That's what being in a real relationship with a real God is really like. Then verse 13 to 17, we read what the angel says. Do not be afraid. Those are the most often repeated words on Jesus' mouth, in Jesus' mouth, on Jesus' tongue, my bad. In the Gospels, do not be afraid. Hear that right now. Hear me say, if you want to experience what a real relationship with a real God is really like, you have to prepare yourself emotionally. Fear is on the horizon. But also hear Christ say, and let out a big exhale. Don't be afraid. He would often couple it with, take courage. It's me. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. And whatever fear that he was feeling at that moment, I imagine it washing away a little bit. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. At this point, I imagine him looking up with big eyes. And you are to call him John. Now, that would have messed with him a little bit because no one in his family lineage was named John. He will be a joy and delight to you. I'm a parent. Whew, good. (laughs) And many will rejoice because of his birth. Wow. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Sweet. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink. Wait, what? And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Hold on a second. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Uh, I just wanted a son. And he'll go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Who? To turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Uh... How can I be sure of this? See, it all makes sense. 
And fast forward to who John became, especially if you're a parent, wrestle with this. He's living out in the wilderness, wearing camel skin, eating locusts, baptizing people with water for repentance. God, I just wanted a baby. (laughs) And it leads to the third thing that we learn about experiencing a real relationship with a real God and what that's like. It's not just accepting that you can be right in all the right ways and not get what you want. And it's not just... It's not just about being shocked into silence, being startled and gripped with fear at times. It's also that God will often give you more than you could have ever dreamed of asking him for. He just wanted a baby. He got John the Baptist. God may give you more than your wildest dreams could imagine, but here's the other thing. He will also demand more from you than you'll ever want to give him. Let me say that again, because it is so crucial to having a real relationship with a real God and experiencing what it is really like. The sovereign storyteller gives you more than you could ever dream of asking him for, but he will also demand more from you than you will ever want to give. Well, pastor, if I trust Jesus, am I going to have to stop doing this or start doing this or make this change in the way I think or act or speak or believe? My response, you say yes to Jesus and everything changes. He will demand more from you than you will ever want to give him. But he will also give you more than you've ever dreamed of asking him for. And you see it in this story. He asks, like I said, the question that is the question of all of us, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man. My wife is well along in years And part two of scene two of Zechariah in the temple is the second thing the angel says to him. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news, this gospel. And now you're going to shut up. You will be silent and not able to speak. I'm speaking to you and I'm telling you, you're not going to speak. Until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true. Mind-blowing. Did you see it? And you have to stop talking. You have to stop talking to experience this reality of being in a relationship with a real God. You have to, you have to shut up. You have to be quiet or you won't be able to hear what God is saying here through the angel. And I still haven't told you what it is. If you think like, wait a minute, did he say it and I missed it? I still haven't said it yet. Here it is. That the good news, he refers to it, the good news, the good news of the storyteller is so good that it's going to come true whether you believe it or not. Do you see that? Gabriel says... I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now, you're going to be silent. You're not going to be able to speak until the day that this day happens because you didn't believe. You lacked faith. You didn't have any trust. And it's still going to come true. Oh, this is the ultimate in experiences of being with a real God in a real relationship. It's almost laughable. Do you see what the angel is declaring, what this story is revealing? God's promises are true whether you believe them or not. This is fantastic. The question you should hear when you come to church, each Sunday when you come to church, 
and you're listening and you're singing and you're celebrating the sacrament, here's what you should hear. Do you get the joke? (laughs) You should not hear, do you believe? Do you believe that these words are true for you? No. It's a joke. Do you get the joke? (laughs) These words are true, even if I don't trust them. God is for me, not against me, even when I don't believe in him. Because friends, just think about it. No amount of faith, no strength of faith will ever make God's promises come true. They're either true or they're not. No amount of faith will ever make Jesus rise from the dead. You can't believe that into happening. Either Jesus lived for us, he died for us, he rose from the grave for us, he secured eternal life for us, or he didn't. But if he did, then it's true. His promises are true, whether you believe them or not. This is the hilarious joke of the gospel, that Jesus has the power to save you whether you believe in him or not. Have you ever heard, have you ever been in a company of friends and somebody tells a joke and like you, it appears that it's really funny, but you don't get it. Have you ever had that experience? Like somebody drops a really good, everybody's uproariously laughing and you're just sitting there like, I don't get it, I don't get it. What does this mean? I don't, can somebody help? You want to get it. You even kind of act like you get it, but you don't get it. Listen, friends, if the gospel of Jesus Christ, Francis Schaeffer called it true truth. If the gospel of Jesus Christ is indeed true truth, and you want to get it, like like you so want to believe it, but it sounds too good to be true, perhaps it's really confusing or maybe even too outlandish, then please hear this. As a gift to you at the beginning of Christmas, the first day of December, if you want to believe, you believe. If you want to get the gospel, if you want to get Jesus, he's yours. You have him. There's a great scene after this passage. This is when the reality of the promise comes true, when John is actually born, later in chapter one. It was time for Elizabeth to have her baby. She gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives by that name. Then they made signs to his father. This is eight days after the baby's been born and he's still not talking. You ever feel like there's a lag in God's promises coming true? Yeah, it's been true since the very beginning. To find out what he would like to name the child, he asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, I get the joke. No, he didn't write that. He wrote, his name is John. And then he started talking. And it says, he spoke with great joy, and he praised God. The gospel, indeed, is so wild and amazing that being in a real relationship with a real God, it really sometimes feels like I'm trying to get a joke that I don't quite understand. That Jesus has the power to save me whether I believe he can or not. That God looks upon me and says, 
that's my beloved son. That is my beloved daughter. Even when you're living your life like an absolute orphan, you're running in the other direction, and yet God the Father's words for you are the same. They never change. His promises are true, and the amount of faith that we have or don't have have no bearing on whether or not they are true. Amen? Amen. Final scene, they're back at home. When the time of service in the temple was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months, she remained in seclusion. And because her husband couldn't talk, I'm imagining, especially if she was an introvert, she was kind of digging this, like, if I don't have to listen to him. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor. He's taken away my disgrace or my shame among the people. Because for a woman in the ancient world, there was nothing more disgraceful or shaming than not having a child. And if you haven't, you can watch it online now, I believe, Ann Craig's story of grace from last week is a, a wonderful telling of this dynamic in a modern day way. The final thing we learn about being in a real relationship with a real God and by way of review, you aren't experiencing what being in a real relationship with a real God is really like until you one, receive that you can do everything right and still not get what you want. Two, until you're startled and gripped with fear. Three, until you can just stop talking. And finally, until you are resting like Elizabeth does in what the Lord has done for her instead of what you are doing for the Lord. I fear because I struggle with it myself that many of us are trying to find rest in all that we're doing for the Lord. The only true rest that can ever be found is in what God has done for us, not what we do for God. And you know what will help you experience that? Knowing that no matter how good or right you live, it doesn't guarantee you getting what you want. Because we're exposed a lot of the time, our efforts to do for God are ultimately just to do for ourselves. We just want what we want. And we think this, will, this is a mildly sanctified way to get it. The other way to experience real, real rest in the Lord is to just lean into an emotional response of being startled and gripped with fear. Perhaps the best is, is to be silent. Can you sit in silence and not say a word to God and just try to listen for the sound. It may be a sound of silence, but he's in the silence. How can you know whether or not your soul is coming to rest? This is how we'll end, kind of answer that question. How can you know whether or not your soul is coming to rest. Well, in this story at the end, Elizabeth does two things and John does one thing that lets us know that their souls were coming to rest. One, first thing Elizabeth does, I've already alluded to it, she celebrates God's favor. We are just coming off of Thanksgiving. Uh, one of my favorite lines in a song right now is a Dirks Bentley uh, country song where he says, you have a heart full of grateful. Do you have a heart full of grateful? A heart full of celebrating God's favor in whatever manner, shape, or form it's come to you. That's a sign that your soul is coming to rest. The second sign from Elizabeth is that she experiences the removal of shame. Now, it does ultimately come, I'll admit, from getting what she wants. But there are many ways in which we can engage with God that act as a removal of shame. 
And whenever you experience a removal of shame, I promise you, your soul will be moving towards rest. And then finally, it's being able to get the joke like Zachariah did, that the angel's promise comes true, not because Zachariah believed it would come true. He did not believe the promise would come true. But it came true despite the fact that he did not believe it would come true. That's the joke of the gospel. It is not the strength of your faith or the amount of your faith that saves you. Jesus saves because Jesus loves to save. And he's very, very, very good at it. So stop talking. Allow yourself to be startled and gripped with fear joyfully recognize that no matter how good I am, it might be good for me to not get what I want. Then your soul will come to rest. I'm going to lead us in an exercise right now that may be a little bit odd for you to do personally and certainly odd to do in a church context. We're going to welcome some silence. Um, I'm going to Oh, I've got a minute ticker. Perfect. I forgot to bring my phone out here. I'm actually going to time us. We're going to spend a minute in silence. And as you engage in this, you, you probably more than once are going to be like, did the watch break? Is like, has it not been a minute yet? <laughs> because a minute of silence, believe it or not, because we are so frenetic at the pace with which we live our lives. Pausing for a minute of silence is very against the grain for us. And as you spend this time in silence, I'm going to give you three options for what to do. All of them involve paying attention to your breathing. The first one is, as you breathe in, you're imagining breathing in the Holy Spirit. And then as you breathe out, you're imagining breathing out your selfish spirit. That's not meant to be condemning. We all have them. Second option is to, this is the Jesus prayer, as you breathe in, not out loud, but say mentally, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. And then as you breathe out, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is to, experience you, this is to help you experience the removal of shame. The first option is to help you experience the celebration of God's favor, that even though you're selfish, he fills you with his Holy Spirit. And then finally, the third option to help us get the joke a little bit, is as you breathe in, pick one of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Breathe that in, joy. And then as you breathe out, frustration or discontent. Creatively come up with a word that is sort of the rotten fruit. <laughs> it's the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, for you go getters out there who never have taken a test where you haven't answered every single question, don't try to do all three. Pick one and stay with it. Close your eyes and begin now. Amen. Now, in addition to that probably being the quietest house of blues has ever gotten, I hope that it was helpful. And I hope that you will consider practicing it as a rhythm. Just pause in the morning, after lunch, afternoon, before you go to bed. 
spend some time in silence, use one of those three options, or come up with your own. Inhale and exhale. We do not have to live life as fast as we think we need to. We can slow down. 